If you drink enough, it'll probably feel like a movie. Um, I'm going to play a quick video for two minutes, and then we'll get into this today. Just before I get going, how many people in here are a financial planner? You make your living selling? Okay. All right. Well, that's most of the group. And how many not financial planners? Okay. And just to show for the financial planners that are here, how many are RIA only? Okay. And is anybody with a broker dealer? Okay. Right. B O O H O O. Um, so, all right. So. <laughs> Why don't I play this for two minutes and then I'm going to talk to you about uh, a little bit about why behind for being on TV. Then I'm going to talk to you specifically about how to get on TV. My goal is to give you enough today so you can leave and in the next month get on a TV station where you live. Okay, that's really what my goal is today. And then I'm going to talk a little about getting into the newspapers. <clears throat> Has, uh, has, anybody in here, has anybody in here created an electronic press kit or done this before? Okay, a couple of people have done this before. And once you get enough media, I'm going to recommend at the end of this that you do something like that because it's going to help you a lot more for getting on TV. Um, and like I said, my goal today is to show you how to actually get on TV and, and how to get it done right. It's really a pretty interesting thing. Uh, I never thought I'd be doing uh, TV before. I just didn't think that was the route that I was going to go but it's getting bigger and bigger the more that I do it now. I've probably done 150 TV appearances, so just to give you perspective now, and I'm gonna share with you kind of the backside of how TV works if you've never done it before. Just show of hands, how many have got done, done once at least one TV? Okay, so a handful of people. All right, before we get going on here, um, if you want my business card, just text TED, T-E-D, to 89800, and you can get my card. That's gonna be the easiest way to get it. Just text my name to 89800. You'll get my business card. You can download it. So if you have any questions after today, um, then you can let me know. If I bomb today and you don't like anything I tell you, then uh, I'm going to give you one app that you can use that you'll impress anybody, anywhere. It's actually a way to pick up clients, by the way. The app that I'm going to give you is something called Tunity. Has anyone ever used Tunity before? So basically, how many of you have been in a bar or an airport lounge and the TV is going? and you can't hear what's on the TV, so it's kind of annoying where you're watching a football game or like last night you're out and about. When you download this app, all you're gonna do is point your phone at the TV. It will scan a picture of the TV, then whatever station it is that you're watching, the sound will blow into your phone. <laughs> what? I, yeah, I was showing, we, yeah, I did this last night at the bar. When I'm on airport lounges, uh, I'm in airport lounges on the road, I've actually picked up a number of clients now just showing them the Tunity app. Because then I tell them, you think, that's cool. You should see what I do for your money. Uh, <laughs> but this is a, uh, this I'm telling you, uh, it's just interesting. Uh, if you ever do this anyway, if I bomb today, at least you walk away with that. 
Since I thought you'd appreciate this, I'll show you my compliance disclosure. Uh, since somebody in here might be a compliance officer or dealing with compliance at a broker dealer, everything that I've used are strategies that I've done. I'm a series 24, 7, 65. I've got all the licenses. I've got a lot of designations of the College for Financial Planning. Every compliance department is different. I've collected 100 social media policies from different firms. I've looked at all of them. The disparity between uh, what firms do today, whether they're small independent broker dealers, how you may operate as an RIA, or what the big firms are doing like Merrill Lynch are all over the place. It's just amazing to me that anybody can regulate what we do today because it's just a wild, wild west. And, and I was with one broker dealer that did it one way. I've seen, I, as an RIA, you can do it a different way. It's just, it's all over the place. Now, a <clears throat> couple things to note in here. How many of you have uh, gone on to Brightscope? So Brightscope, honestly, was probably one of the first things. The question is, you know, what makes you a better financial advisor than somebody else? You know, is it your years of experience? Is it because you got a CFP and a lot of designations? Is it how much money you manage? For years, the only uh, place financial advisors ever got listed was Barron's. And Barron's would list the top money managers, the 50 in every state, but it was totally predicated on assets under management. And there's no way as a small independent RIA, you're gonna be able to compete with a gigantic group team at Merrill. All right, they have $14 billion, you're not gonna compete. Or maybe one group, they just go after 401k, so they have, you know, 1.5 billion, but it's, it's not really relative if you're just dealing with individuals. This is not the same. So they were the first one that started to take a survey out the last couple of years on the most influential social media financial advisors. Uh, and they think they've done it for two or three years now. And I get ranked number nine on their list last year. I was the only person at the time, I think, in the top 30 that was with a broker dealer. So I guess I had an extra hoop to go through. But I think that these lists are going to be important because when I teach you today about what I've learned about media, you know, the reality is, is that uh, clients only read very little. So when they see things like, oh, you were ranked number nine in the country for financial advisors, they may not have read the part that said for social media, right? And so remember, because you're all doing blogging, you're putting out content and things like that, um, they don't always remember that. Uh, by doing the blogging that I've done, I'm actually so grateful for being at FinCon. I came to my first one in 2012 in Denver. I remember going to a session from a guy named Len Penzo who talked about title writing. And I didn't, when I went to my first one, I don't know how many financial advisors were there, but it was not many. And I thought I was at a Star Trek convention. I really, you know, uh, I, I, I had no idea what was going on. I met Mr. Money Mustache. I met Ramit Sethi. I just, I, I didn't know, I didn't know what these guys were doing. It was, uh, it was interesting, but I knew that I, I wanted a blog, and I had been blogging for a couple of years just throwing up content. I was, from, from 2009, I was putting up three blogs a week. Pretty much, I didn't go to church on Sunday. I just wrote articles, and that's all that I did was basically post up content, and then coming to these helped me figure a little bit about how I'd refine my content, and it, it ultimately gave me a strategy here to get into media. But I got into the Wall Street Journal, and basically now twice a month, sometimes three times a month, I write an article for them. So think about the power media-wise of sitting down with somebody and they say, I have $5 million. Why do I want to use you versus using one of the big companies, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch? You know, how do I know you're not Bernie Madoff? You know, these kinds of questions that come up and I say, well, I mean, I'm writing for the Wall Street Journal. Is your broker at Morgan Stanley writing for the Wall Street Journal? I mean, it's just, no, if I didn't ask yourself why. Now, those kinds of things are very impactful in wheeling assets over uh, from another firm. Then I got on uh, about three years ago on a headline news, CNN. I literally do that almost every weekend. So during the week, it's Robin Mead and Jennifer Westoven. That's sort of the, the, the main team. On the weekend, there's a guy named Corey Wire that does sports. There's Lynn Smith um, that does the anchor, and then I'm their personal finance guy now. So I'm going to tell you how I got there. I started about three months ago doing the Weather Channel. I know you're going to laugh when I say that, like, what the hell is a financial advisor doing on the Weather Channel? But when I share with you what TV is looking for is no different than the way that you're blogging today, which is content. So I'll go on Sunday this week, and I'll talk about six ways to save money in the fall. It's, it'll be a fluff piece, but I did one recently when Louisiana had the floods about flood insurance. It was a piece that I did four times on the Weather Channel. So all those small media hits, I'm going to explain to you about the impact that it has on people. And then... Um, I don't know how many media outlets it is now, but it's a lot more probably than 100 just over time uh, and dealing with reporters. So these matter in your practice because when you're a small or RIA or a decent sized RIA and you're growing, you may think you have a better money management solution, but as we know, there's more robo out there. 
Uh, so the question is, why, why will somebody go with you? Media has a very big impact in how people are influenced in the way they make decisions. And I'm going to show you a little bit about that. So why would you care about being a mini celebrity advisor? Uh, I, was a, I was a group vice president for American Express. When American Express became Ameriprise Financial, I decided to part ways with them and basically go independent. So for those of you that have been in the business for a while, imagine saying, yeah, I'm going to start from zero again, make my salary nothing, and basically build from scratch. Uh, it's not a lot of fun. But I, I uh, wanted to do the X and Y generation more than baby boomers and retirees, so I started a company called Oxygen Financial. The last five letters are X, Y, Gen, and I started that in the beginning of 2008 when it wasn't really as popular to be talking about X, Y. I thought there was going to be a big market, and I still do a tremendous market that's coming here uh, in the X and Y generation. So we're a little bit north of $600 million of AUM. I don't buy practices. I don't like buying somebody else's problems. So I basically build the marketing to do what I call to be pull marketing. So we don't do any real push marketing per se. We look to drive people and optimize them into our website. I think at the rate that we're bringing in assets now, even if there isn't market growth, we'll be at a billion in a couple of years. And a billion, you're at a pretty decent size RA. That's where I see you know, street credibility at a billion dollars. Consumers are heavily influenced by what they see and hear uh, on TV. Uh, obviously, this is most noted by the presidential election. So I was told not to talk politics, and I won't. But, um, but just know that people are heavily influenced. How many of you have heard of Fisher Investments? What do they hate? Annuities. There we go. So, but it worked, right? They tell you, if you bought an annuity, the annuities are devils. Nobody should have them. They're terrible. <clears throat> you get ripped off. And w whether it's wrong or it's right, it's how they brand position and the way that they market. So it also makes your existing clients want to refer you more. When clients see you in the media and you're consistently in the media, they assume you're more busy. They assume that you're more desirable. So this is sort of the small restaurant syndrome. The less seats they believe that are in the restaurant, the more that they want to get into the restaurant. So the more that I do in media, people are saying, can you still take on clients? Or, you know, or does your firm still take on clients? You know, just It's an appearance that is given uh, from them. Question will be, uh, where will our industry be 20 years from now? It may be hard to say, but you can imagine and seeing the evolution of the real estate industry and the access that clients have to information before they actually hire a real estate agent, ask yourself over the next 20 years when these upcoming consumers, how many of them are really going to take time to check you out before they drop their money with you? I'm telling you today, there are some people that didn't do business with you because they checked you out and they didn't think you were legit or they didn't think you were good enough. And it probably happened to me too. Uh, you won't know because they won't call you and say, yeah, I looked at Google, I checked your images, I saw what was in the news and I didn't like you. They're not going to tell you that. In fact, people won't tell you to your face that they don't like you. Not often. Um, so what I see today more and more, and I see this when clients come in and see us, is that pretty much everybody out there I think is a Google stalker. Uh, you may have done it before in one of these sessions. But the reality is, is that when you meet someone or you know someone, you're going to em end up, most of you have probably Googled yourself and do on a regular basis to see how you look. Well, people are doing that too. and so. Realize that before people meet with you, they're going to do the search, and they're going to determine if your brand is the right place to do business. Although we focused on X and Y, an interesting phenomenon is happening in our business. Our clients in their 40s right now are starting to refer us to their parents in their 70s. And while I marketed heavily as X, Y, I didn't get a couple of clients that were their parents. This is a few years back, maybe four or five years. Somebody said, we like you, we like the company, we like everything you do but it doesn't look like we qualify to be a client. And I thought, what? What do you mean you don't qualify to be a client? It's like, yeah, we have $2 million, but we're 70, and it kind of looks like you only focus on people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. I was like, I am dumb. What do you mean? I, lost, I just lost $2 million. What am I thinking? So although we're still branded XY, it's not as pronounced on the website as it was when we first started. When we first started, it was punch you in the face. It was all over the website, all over the content. Now it's slightly less pronounced because if you market Gen X, and Gen X now is you know, early 50s, a lot of them have parents in their 70s that don't want to stay at the big wirehouses. They want to come down and work with their kids. So if you really market that way, you just have to be, be a little bit careful in here. What I've learned is that consumers are dumb. Now, I say this not in a, in a derogatory way. When I say they're dumb, they're just short on time. So they just read and they get sound bites. That's why people watch 
HLN or small nuggets of CNN or five minutes of TV because they get nuggets of information, when they search, pretty much all that they do is they read what's on the blue line. So I had uh, a couple years ago, uh, I had sponsored a top 25 uh, fastest growing companies in Atlanta. And then I had a whole bunch of our clients that said, congratulations for being one of the fastest 25 growing companies in Atlanta. And I thought, were we? Really? I didn't see us on the list. And then I realized that they were looking at this and, and thinking that we were the, the ones out there. So if you don't think the media and what I'm going to show you influences how people think, just think about a couple things like this. Anybody used to watch Entourage at all? I mean, so the brand on here that Avion is a huge brand right now, massive brand, all driven by sort of this uh, story that was on, on HBO, massive. People see images like this, and they constantly see the athletes, LeBron James being a very famous one, wearing beats. I think LeBron sold his stake for when it went in, and they sold to Apple for $30 million or $35 million, somewhere in that ballpark. But when they see beats, and they see it over and over again, it becomes an image that's in their mind. We're in San Diego, so I had to, I had to, throw, one, I had to throw one Ron Burgundy up there. San Diego. Um, and, uh, but these... Power, very powerful images. So I don't want you to underestimate this. What I'm saying to you may seem like, well, do people really care if like, you're on local TV? Is it really going to matter? Yeah, it matters a lot. And, and because you know content better than 99% of the financial advisors, the way you start to repurpose that content through everything you do in all of your channels makes it seem larger than it really is. So once you get a crack in here, it will be, it will be better. This may seem funny or not to you, but I always think about it, that if any of these three people became a financial advisor, they would crush us. And the reason they would crush us is because the Beebs, he's got 88 million people following him on Twitter right now. 88 million. Katy Perry's still the uh, queen bee. She has 92.8 million. And I always put Kim K up there, who only has 48 million, because if I ask you what Kim Kardashian does, what would you say? Nothing. That is the answer I get all the time. Well, I'll tell you what, I would love to make 20 million a year doing nothing, okay? Actually, she's brilliant, their family's brilliant, good, bad, or indifferent, and how they use the media and social media to be able to monetize their product themselves and their brand. So all this stuff is big. Is the Beebs the best uh, singer? I don't know. <laughs> is Katy Perry the best singer? Some people love her, some don't. You know, most people don't like Kim Kardashian, but the truth is she's very, very successful at what she does. When we did this a couple of years back, uh, how many of you applied to your firm to Inc? Anyone applied, done Inc before? By the way, uh, how many have seen Inc magazine where they show the top 500 or the top 5,000? It's actually one of the biggest joke lists of all time if you actually go through the exercise. I didn't real realize it until I went through the exercise. First of all, they don't look at profitability of firms at all. It's only predicated on top line revenue. Once your firm's in business for three years, if you had an RIA that was at 100 grand, and then it went to you know, 800 grand, and then it went to a million six, you could show 18 million percent growth and probably get in the Inc. 500. All you have to have is like a CPA or somebody audit the outside financials, you know, sign off, and that's it. So when we did it, we went in and we went into Times Square, and literally that picture was up for about nine seconds. It wasn't up long. It wasn't like we were on Times Square all day. But we took a shot of that, and what do you think happened when we sent it out to all of our clients? You guys were on Times Square? We, of course we were. What are you talking about? We're the best firm here in Atlanta. I mean, people are loving us all around the country, right? And you laugh when you hear, when you hear me say that, but people believe what? They believe what they see in the media. It's very, very powerful stuff. So how do you get on television? Let's talk about the, the core of this. The best way to start this is to pick a local station, OK? Uh, CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox. Typically, you'll never get on the morning show. That will be very difficult to do. And the 5 and 6 o'clock news will be very difficult. Most stations now will run a 10 o'clock news segment. That is your best place to get on TV to start because at the 10 o'clock segment is where they look for the most filler time, okay? Think about what local news does. What do they report? They report a couple of murders and stabbings and, you know, really negative news is what they do. Then there's sports, then there's weather, and maybe a couple of human interest stories. It's really funny when you get behind the scenes in this, but 10 o'clock news. In Atlanta, I typically do NBC and Fox. I do NBC the most right now. 
I probably every other week I'm doing segments on, on uh, NBC. 10 p.m. 10 p.m. news is your best bet to get on uh, TV. I haven't had it yet, no. No, in fact, the, funny, the funniest thing about this is that I repurpose some of my stories, and I do them on CNN, NBC. I just, I do what we do with our content. I repurpose them. I'm like, surely they're not going to be happy if I do the same story in three places. I don't even think they know what's going on. I mean, I really don't. It's, I'm, it's bizarre to me, but it's like, all right, apparently you guys don't talk to each other, so I'll just keep doing this until you, until you tell, me, tell me something else. Okay. First question is, how do you get to them? The beauty about you knowing social media, again, better than 99% of the financial advisors, is that all of the people on TV, all of the producers, all of the writers are very visible. They're either on LinkedIn, they're actually on the website. When I say the website, like if it's 11 Alive News, they're on the website, or they have a Twitter feed that you can direct message them. It's very, very easy to get access to them. Here's the first thing to know. Stations are very thin on money today. So you heard Clark talk yesterday about how you know we were laughing like traditional newspaper. It's very difficult. You know, there's not a lot of money to be made in it anymore. Don't think TV is that much better. TV is getting crushed right now. As you know, a lot of people are cutting the cord. They're going to streaming. Uh, it's evolving to become a different type of medium. So they are not rich, especially NBC. I can tell you, NBC is like a ghost crew. It used to be when I was doing NBC in the beginning, there were like 30 people in the newsroom. When you go in to do the segments now in the newsroom, there's like five people. There's the anchors, there's the weather guy, there's one producer, maybe two writers or one computer person. That's it. Which means they don't have time to do what? Yeah, they don't have time to do research and they don't have time to build content. And that's where you come in because I'm going to show you if you can produce the content for them, you're basically going to be an executive producer. You can get on TV as much as you want because they don't have the time to think of stories. They just don't. So the easiest way is to send them a direct thing. Now, how many of you have used uh, HARO before, H-A-R-O? OK, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But it's a very similar process to HARO, although they're not putting out a thing like, hey, at the 10 o'clock news, we need a story on this. But if you just send it to them, actually, you can use HARO to your advantage because the writers create the stories, and then you can send it back to TV. You can get on here. You'll send a brief email, which I'm going to show you. It's something called a storyboard. TV basically works in four blocks. So when you talk to them, if you want to talk TV language, they have an A block, B block, C block, and D block. I know it sounds real um, eighth grader-ish, but that's the way that it works. The A block is typically 10 to 1015, B block's 1015 to 1030, C block's 1030 to 1045, D block's 1045 to 11 o'clock. They work in 15-minute segments, of which how much do you think is commercials, roughly? It, no, 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 it's probably three to five minutes. It depends on the station. HLN is shorter. Local news is longer because, you know, different prices, how they monetize. You really only have like 10 minutes of TV, which is why I'm going to show you that TV might seem glamorous, but it's really very, very short pops of info. Realize this. You're not going in for like a 20-minute interview. It's not like they want to sit with you and talk about, hey, you know, uh, where's the uh, price of oil headed? You know, it's just that they're not interested in that stuff. They could care less about it. When I show you what they care about, it's going to make you wonder a little bit, as I still do today. But it is what it is if you want to, want to get on TV. So what's a storyboard? A storyboard is that as opposed to writing them an email that says, hey, I got this great story. Uh, you know, it's a great shopping day here in the state of Texas. And you can do this and that and the other. You should really check this out because they won't read that. Producers and the writers there are thinking infographics. So if anyone's ever done an infographic or you, you know, built one of those, they think in infographics because think about what you see on TV. It's me talking, and then after I talk, what comes up on the screen? A little storyboard that shows two dummy bullet points. And that's really what they are. They're like two little bullet points. It's like, duh, that's what you just said. Uh, but that's really how it works. Then we talk for a minute, I'm going to tell you, or 30 seconds, and then another storyboard goes up. And so during the segment, sometimes the storyboard is up and you don't see me. And then sometimes um, you'll see me face to face. So if I did one on five year New Year's resolution, this is what I would send them. I'd say, hey, um, 11 Alive, I've got a great story for you. We've got a story about New Year's resolutions. And here's the way that I think the storyboard should work. Because I want you to think about what's going to happen behind the scenes in the station. They're very light on the people that are in there in the station. So there's some producer in there. 
they have a little software to make those infographic boards. They take your bullet points, and guess what they do? They type them, and they make the little screens. Then they write out a little script for the, for the anchor, OK? So even the anchors on CNN, 99% of what they do is read the teleprompter, OK? Which the first time you do an interview, it can be disconcerting. Because basically, they'll be like, hey, we have Ted Jenkins here today. You know, you're over here. It's like, are you going to be talking to me or, uh, or not? Uh, you know, what, what's that, what's, how's that going to work? Well, a lot of times, they're not talking to you. They're talking to the teleprompter. You're looking at like the side of their face. And then basically, like TV is still going. And they, they capture with different, um, uh, different cameras in there. The better the storyboard, the cleaner it is, the better off you're going to do. And I'm going to explain to you about fact checking in a second, second, but this is what it looks like. Once they get the storyboard, what HLN will do, what the Weather Channel will do, what NBC will do is they'll create something that looks like this. Before Trump changed his um, tax brackets, I did a very initial one when they started running on all the candidates on, uh, on NBC. Oh, uh, no, I think I did this on HLN. But they basically tape, get, take what I give them, and then they basically put it on that board. And that's how the segment is driven. Three, four boards, three, four little quick questions, and then basically we're out. And I'm going to go through how the, how the segment will operate. Most segments, almost all of them, are two to three minutes. How quick do you think two to three minutes go by? Like that. So you can't get on there and they say, uh, oh, so what, what are the Trump tax rates going to be? Well, we don't know exactly where he's going with the tax rates, but we think it's going to be you know, 12 percent, 25 percent, and then he might do the, they're not interested in that. They want you to report the what? The news. It's going to be at 12 percent, 25 and 33 percent, and then Clinton's, what she's thinking about is adding a surtax at the highest level, and then she's adding a Buffett tax. This is for people that make more than one million, right? It's a very consolidated thing. If you cannot have brevity while you're on TV, it won't work. It will not work. If you go on there and you want to pontificate about stuff, you actually have two and a half minutes to get it done. If you do live TV, it's even worse because you'll have, a, you'll have a, a little earpiece in, and you hear the producer going, 25 seconds, 20 seconds, 15 <laughs> seconds. I'm like, oh shit, you know, 15 seconds. You know? uh, worst one that I had on there is I, I went on CNN uh, once, and they forgot to turn my mic on. And the worst thing in the world ever on live TV is to have somebody in, you know, you're, you're, the TV can't see you and somebody's like jangling in your pocket trying to get the, the mic on. So most segments, two to three minutes. The producers have the bullet points ready. Once you get good at this, here's the beauty. They'll send you the, the, the anchor script before you go on, okay? So if like you're like, well, how much of TV is live and how much of it is made up? It's all made up, you know? How much of it is like off the cuff and people are just talking? Never. It's just not. I haven't seen one yet, and I've sat, I've sat for a whole day down at CNN. It's all very choreographed. Like it or not like it, forget about it. You're trying to get on TV, so it doesn't just know how it works. So the anchor is going to have all the questions. If you get good in with the producer, they'll give you all the questions. Here's what she's going to say or he's going to say. Here's the questions. You need to be finished in 2 minutes and 20 seconds. Is that with her talking or with me talking? With everybody talking, 2 minutes and 20 seconds. If you fact check your sources for them, they will love you even more. So if you send the storyboard and you say, by the way, here's where I got this fact, here's where I got this fact, because if you don't fact check it for them, it just creates more what? Work. Oh, OK, this looks good, but now I've got to make sure that 17% of the people have this and 28% fact check for them. Okay? By doing this homework, I'm telling you, there's no financial advisors out there doing this stuff. It's rare. You see some people on TV here and there, but it's rare that people will see the backside of this. So you're, you're really, at the end of the day, you're the producer of your own segments. Why does a TV station like this? How much do they pay you? Zero. Zero. What do I get paid to be on TV? Zero. But what would it cost you to run a three-minute commercial on CNN? <laughs> it, it's expensive. Even on local TV. Has anyone ever priced out advertising on local TV? A minute of commercial on there is probably going to be a couple grand. So you're talking six grand of time for nothing. If you go on weekly, that's 300,000 of advertising money that costs you what? Nothing. Now, you've got to be willing to deal with the times. Sometimes they'll say, hey, we need you down here at 8 p.m. tonight. You can't go, oh, well, my daughter has a soccer game. They don't care. So you might have to say, I missed a soccer game. I've got to go for three, or three minutes. You know, they're not, you, there's a million people like us, so they don't really need us. You know, as I, as I get deeper into it, I get myself more solidified. 
but they don't really need you. This is why they blow through anchors all the time. There's always somebody else that will do this. So what are great topics? How many of you are blogging now? Well, then you've really done your work. Take a cool blog, nothing securities based. This isn't a compliance thing, they just don't care. If you're like, I've got a great thing I want to share with you on why we need more large cap value now. Yeah, don't care. Because the average person that's watching the 10 o'clock news is not like, that's really interesting about, you know, why to buy, you know, emerging markets now. They don't care. You know what people care about in the 10 o'clock news? Fluff stuff. How do I get a better deal when I go shop on Black Friday? It's Father's Day. Show me five gifts for under $50. Those are the blogs that they care about. So when I first send them in, I'm like, God, I feel like I've, I've 25 years. I've been doing this for a career. I've got, you know, all these degrees. I'm, I'm degrading myself. Actually, you're not. Because when people see you on TV, you could talk about nothing. And people still think what? He's on TV. He must know what? He must know what he's talking about. <laughs> Even though the truth is, I might have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> so it's funny to me because I'll, I'll do blogs sometimes and I'll do some research. Now they'll probably take politics. Let me, give, let me give you one I just did. Anybody play fantasy football? I wrote them a segment on fantasy football insurance. Has anyone seen that? OK, well, I'll give you one pitch right now to go take back. This is good for radio, by the way, for the sports stations. Fantasy football insurance works like this. If you pay a $200 league fee, you pay 10% of your league fee to the insurance company, $20. If you have a player and they go down for more than nine games, you can collect your league fee back. Does that sound like a good deal for the insurance company? <laughs> Right? Who's going to collect on that? Like three people? Uh, it's like uh, you've seen with clients that buy accidental death and dismemberment insurance. I don't think in 25 years I've seen anybody collect on it. But it's only $1.40 a pay period, so I might as well just sign up for it. That's the way that people think. So topics, lists, holiday calendars, seasons, day-to-day -day type stuff. Now, if you can get something timely like the flood, when the floods happen in Louisiana, just because you don't live in, in Baton Rouge, it don't matter. If you can go on TV and say, let's talk about that you may not think you have a floodplain where we are, but here's why you might want to buy flood insurance. Or people that had the flood, what should they do now? What do they do when they go to FEMA, or what should they, what should they do, OK? What do you expect when you go to the station? I've done a lot of live TV and regular TV. It's not Hollywood. CNN is the closest to Hollywood, <laughs> uh, but it's not Hollywood, OK? You don't go there, and they're just like, hey, Ted, wait, great to see you. Let's you know, get down here and sit in the green room. It don't work like that. You're basically there, and they're like, yeah, slap on a mic. Some person comes over, shakes your hand, and you're on TV, OK? CNN actually does have a makeup room. It's unlikely that local TV will put you in a makeup room. They, they won't. You're likely to just go on there, and they go, man, we don't care what you look like. Uh, go here. Interestingly enough, the lighting in the studios will be far different. Some of the studios go into the lighting's really good, because you'll see yourself on TV and say, but I don't thought I looked that bad. Uh, or sometimes you'll see it, but, but um, some stations will have makeup and some won't. Uh, but the key for you on TV to get invited back is that you must be brief, you must be on time with your points, and you must be personable. Don't worry about the cameras and the lights and all this stuff. Just look at the anchor, make your points, because if you're like slow and, and uh, um, you can't get through this stuff quick, they won't invite you back. They will not invite you back. They want people to come on, make the points. To the extent that you can break down very difficult financial topics and make them very easy to understand, you become more valuable for the station. Station wants things at an eighth grader level. So if you're on there and you're talking about highfalutin jargon on there, like you know this whole thing just happened with the Fed and we don't know what's going to really happen, but if you're on there talking about you know well you know Japan's going to negative interest rates, you know that this is not CNBC. It's not. Everything else is not CNBC. It's it's all regular stuff. Okay, so talk to the reporter, and then I always bring food. When I say bring food, basically all the people in the behind the scenes cubies get nothing. They get paid like 40 grand to sit in a cube. So if you bring them food and you're like their bestest buddy and friend, then eventually the producers will just work with you without the anchors. So they'll just be like, hey, Ted, what's going on? I found that work really good at the Weather Channel because like on, on a weekend Weather Channel, there's nobody in there. There's like five people. So how do you know when you get status in this thing? About a year ago, I got my, my, uh, a CNN badge, so I'm technically like an employee that doesn't get paid by CNN. So I'm on their employee payroll, but I literally go down to CNN studios, I swipe my badge, nobody says hire by. I go up, 
They put on makeup, you go on TV, the segment lasts three minutes, and then you're out. So it's not like you're having chatty Cathy with the, uh, with the anchors. It's not that they're nice, but they just want you to get in, be professional, do what you're doing, get gone. How do you know when you get status? I recently got a letter from a prisoner. Uh, <laughs> Greetings, I'm proud of this letter to you and it's an honor to meet and communicate with you. My name is Charles Harris and I'm a businessman, entrepreneur and product designer of a multi-billion dollar product portfolio and I want you to help me monetize your financial management and fundraising skills. I can make you a billionaire. I look forward to your response, Mr. Charles Harris, 751-506, Washington State Prison. Um, I'd say I've gotten at least a half dozen prisoner letters. Uh, so yeah, so there's a negative side to this. Uh, a negative side to this, and realize I'm just still doing small time stuff. When you look at, you saw Gene Chatsky, you know, Gene's been, uh, you know, when you get on the Today Show, like you've hit pay dirt, right? You get to become a regular on a major thing like Good Morning America. Very difficult to do. Anybody live in New York? So if you're in the city, you got a better chance to do what's in your city. The reason I get Weather Channel and CNN is I live in Atlanta. I don't know how many know Weather Channel's headquartered in Atlanta. And obviously, CNN is actually mostly headquartered in New York. All that really remains in Atlanta is international and headline news. All the rest of the CNN is not in Atlanta anymore. So, you know, getting to a national stuff, unless it's in your city, very difficult. They're not going to want to put you on Skype. They want you in there live. You know, this is not going to happen. So, um, so let me just stop there first. Is there any questions on, on the TV stuff? Sure. I've just, I've told most of the wealthy clients that sometimes they'll be like, you know, we really want to see more meaty articles because we don't want to know about five apps you can impress your friends with. And I tell them, you know, how'd you get rich? You got rich by being cheap. If you weren't cheap, you'd pay me higher fees. But you don't, right? You know, and so the truth is, the way you got rich, now you have a lot of money, so you may not care as much about this, but a lot of the people that we write with care about it, so. Oh, yeah. No. I, I don't. It doesn't mean you can. I mean, I'm, I'm surround sound, you know, because I do, I do radio, I do podcast, I do TV, but, I, but my TV, I'm repurposing everywhere. I'm, a, I'm in MailChimp, you know, so I repurpose it in my MailChimp. I've got it all on the website, you know. I mean, everywhere I can, I'm constantly putting, putting it in with people in the community. Yeah. And do you go forward as a certified financial planner and owner of Oxygen, or do you just go forward as just a simple uh, resource person? The more nondescript, the better. It's like you don't have to tout your own. You could just say, hey, I'm a CFP, 20 years, I've got a local firm. This would be a great you know, news story, a great human interest story. I'd come down to the studio morning, night, whenever you need me, I'll be in and out. You know, it's, the brevity is better because. Um, actually, there aren't a lot of people like us pitching them. And if you hire a PR firm, they're really doing the same thing. A lot of PR firms will tell you, we got all these contacts. N no, you don't. Um, they might have a couple, but it's not as many as you think. And, and by the way, once you get on TV once, I, I didn't put this in here, um, every one of your areas has a regional Emmy society, okay? I'm actually applying for an Emmy this year. Now, I know when I say this to you, you're, you're laughing. You're like, what the, dude, you did like two minutes on TV. Uh, but you know, like sometimes when you watch the real Emmys, they'll be like, we had another day of science and fiction, and here is, you know, all this other stuff. Well, the truth is I learned that every area has a regional Emmy. In the Southeast, it's called the Southeast Emmys. You can join once you do your first TV appearance. It costs $75. I started going to their meetings, and they have all these stupid categories that you can win an Emmy in. It'll be like, uh, you know, a short nonfiction TV side segment, you know? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply for one this year. I'll find my best segment. I'm gonna apply for it. I could care less if I win. All I wanna do is get what? Nominated. Yeah! I'm gonna send out my new bios to people like, meet Ted Jenkins, Emmy nominated, <laughs> you know? And then people are like, what'd you, what'd you write? And I'm like, oh, she wrote a lot of stuff, you know? <laughs> you know? You laugh, we laugh when we say it, but what do people think? 
when you see that, you'd be like, you must be good if you got an Emmy nominated. Ah, who knows? I might have lost 10% of all my portfolios last year. You don't know if I'm good or not, right? This is, this is the nature of TV. So I would, once you get on once, I would definitely join. And by the way, if you go to the meetings, guess who's at all the meetings? Producers, anchors, writers. It's all the people at the local station. So they start to see your face a little bit more. And it's like, yeah, I've been on NBC. I've been on Fox. And Yeah. I try to think about how I can pitch. It's a lot of you know, tax complexity. Right. I don't know that it's you would start with a, a basic thing, like uh, five things you need to know when you travel internationally. Like people don't know, uh, you know, what, do, what credit card should I use? Do I, do I need to have a certain kind of bank? Is it better to carry travel? Sh you know, it's, that's, find, something find something simple to start because they're not going to want to get on and, and basically say, hey, if you're an expat and you live in Israel, what, what do you do? You know? They're not going to care about that, but like I make simple things for going overseas. You know, like with all the Brexit stuff now, maybe like five reasons you need to travel to Europe now. You know, the pound's at $1.30, and it's like that fluff piece will be good. And then, you know, you can still put yourself out as like international, you know, tax uh, financial advisor. Hundred okay. percent. General general stuff. Uh, I would call it neighborhood talk. You're out with a bunch of neighbors and they're talking about stuff. And they're like a good example now is I think um, it's next week or the week October first. FAFSA moved its uh, filing forms back to October first now for filing for FAFSA, not January one. And so I might put a uh, an article a thing out this week and say you got to have me on this weekend because FAFSA changes thing to Monday and it's going to blow up Americans. So don't be surprised next week, and if I'm on CNN, I'm basically like, five things you need to know about FAFSA. You know, uh, you know here's the tax year they use. And so it's like that kind of like basic gritty stuff affects all Americans, you know, rather than, you know, should you do a 529 plan or an UGMA? You know, I mean, it, it, they, they don't care about that, so definitely. I, I have learned that if you have a specialty donut shop, they love that shit. Uh, you know, we have a place in Atlanta called Sublime Donuts, and it's kind of like a Sublime. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. Uh, like, but Voodoo Donuts would be a good example. It's like, you know, all kind of donuts, and they'll just they'll, they'll wipe it up. Because all those little producers, even at Headline News is a big one, it's like eight producers. They sit in two cubes. They look at each other. And when you go to their desks, it's just like nasty food everywhere. You know, empty cans of Sprite, Doritos, you know. Um, you could bring five bags of those munchy Doritos and you'd probably do just as fine with that as well. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah. If you're not a natural, if you don't think you'll be natural in front of the camera, getting a media coach is probably a good idea to just get you ready for like how to act on camera. I never had a media coach, you know. I, I just, um, you know, I don't know. It just worked for me. I mean, I would, I probably could have blown. I wouldn't have known at the time I was blowing myself out of it, but I just, I, I was okay and comfortable in talking. But you know, to get to like read down like a two and a half minute script on a storyboard, it's probably worth it because if you get in and you're good, they'll bring you back. You give them the ideas, they'll bring you back, and then you get into a rhythm. And then once the anchors like you, then they're just, gonna, you're going to be their person. Yeah. I do, I do a Money Monday, and I'm trying to decide, is it worth going off-brand to do like a financial journalist to get more live TV media appearances, or should I do less media in my media? Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of media. You know, we're XY, but I talk about all kinds of stuff on TV. You know, I just, I really, to me, what this is about is the reason you're blogging is you're trying to get yourself out there, and people like, get to know me and get to know my brand. Well, you all have a personal brand, and so what I've built over time is my personal brand, and then I can rain make for the firm. I can bring in more leads for the firm. A good example is tomorrow I'm not going to be a part of the conference because some guy in Huntington Beach saw me on CNN, and we made an appointment for tomorrow, and he has $5 million. So what are the chances of me getting $5 million? I'm out here. I'm going up there. I think it's reasonable, right? And when I go out there, and he's like, man, I finally met the person I saw on TV, right? I'm nothing, right? Remember, I'm, I'm still I'm nothing. But for them, I'm what? It's like, you're the guy on TV, you know? And it's like, if you've ever met like a reality TV star, they're nothing. 
I mean, I know a couple of them have like made it, made it, but most of them it's like, dude, what show were you on? Survivor? It's like, you know, I don't know. But it doesn't really matter. When people see that, it, it means a lot because now you're a more trusted resource. Why, CNN wouldn't bring you on if they didn't think you knew what you were doing. Right? Why would they bring you on? Why would NBC bring you on if you didn't know what you were doing? Okay? By the way, none of those places fact check. Um, question? Okay, so I, this is going to go quickly, just time, but I'll give you all the slides. Mo, are, how many of you using HARO again? Easiest way to get to reporters is through HARO or help a reporter out. When I, I don't remember when the site went live, but I've been using it ever since then. Oh, yeah, it's HARO. We're not going to have the time to go through this because I want to answer your question about the radio because it's a similar strategy with the radio. But this help a reporter, they run somewhere between 10 to 20 stories a day, and all you do is respond to the reporter and you give them a few bullet points and you can get quoted. The easiest to get quoted in is probably US News and World Report, uh, Market Watch, The Street, uh, Bank Rate. You know, they're running something almost every day looking for a quote from a financial advisor. Once you get quoted, you can display them up on your website. Although there was one company that gave me a cease and desist. I can't remember which one it was. But they said, no, you can't use our name on your website. The other ones I did. And basically, you'll, there'll be a story. When you subscribe, there'll be something that comes in every day that looks like this. It says, how to negotiate higher salary, uh, retailers, uh, CPAs. And then what you're going to do, you're going to have to read through this just given our time today. You're going to basically send them a quick note and say, uh, I want to get into, I want to give you some ideas for your, I'm just showing you this way. I want to get ideas. Uh, I'm a certified financial planner. Been doing this for 20 years. I know a lot about real estate. And once you send them this, the key is to still send them infographics. How many of you have been quoted in a newspaper? How many words were in your quote? I want you to think about this, because you go back and look at it, you'd be like, damn, we talked for like 20 minutes on the phone. They said, Ted Jenkins, certified financial planner, says, uh, rich people suck at budgeting, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I said a lot more than that, you know? And it makes you see on the media when you see stuff quoted, you're like, I wonder what was the whole conversation and the eight words. So I learned that I stopped writing them diatribes on here about what I thought about real estate and blah, 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 blah. And when I, when I go back and I do these now, the easiest way to get quoted, I'll just show you this, is you just give them little bullet points. Oh, we want to know about homeowner's insurance. OK, here's bullet point one, two, three. And then a lot of times, the reporters will not call you back. They're on very, very tight deadlines. And they basically will take your quote. And then after, they'll be like, yeah, we published you. Every once in a while, they'll call you and say, yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit more. Once they talk more, that's your opportunity to get engaged with the reporter. 80% of the reporters I've dealt with, guess who they are? They're freelancers. They don't work for newspapers. Okay? One of the biggest uh, magazines I got into this year is Real Simple. Does anyone know Real Simple? It's a good hit. Like Real Simple is a, a, a legit big time magazine. And I said, so do you write for Real Simple? No. Well, who do you write for? Everybody, whoever pays me. OK, um, that's fine. Are you going to quote me? Uh, that's what I want to know. And so w once you know those freelancers, you, if you give the freelancers ideas, they love it because they can take that idea and get what? And when they get paid, guess what they're going to do? They're going to quote you. There's the quid pro quo, right? I'll give you ideas. You get paid for writing freelancing. I don't want to get paid for writing freelancing. I really don't. And then, and then you, you, uh, you quote me in here, OK? Now, the thing in here, just in the interest of time, because I know it's getting here, we, I'm not going to go through backlinks because um, obviously we just talked about SEO, but I'm doing all that in here. And then don't discount terrestrial radio. You know Clark, because uh, I'm in Atlanta, I mean, Clark's like a god in Atlanta. I mean, everybody loves Clark. You can just see he's like a likable guy. You're like, this guy seems like he couldn't hurt anybody. Um, but he's loved in Atlanta. And don't discount terrestrial radio. How many of you watch ESPN today? Or watch ESPN at all, or watch any stations where they bring on the expert. Even ESPN now has legal expert, financial expert. How did they get there? They got there because somebody gave them an idea. So how many of you, if you listen to like a local sports station, and I just mentioned fantasy football insurance, if you email the producer and say, hey, I got a great idea. I'll come on for a piece of the segment. I love to talk to the uh, guys and gals about fantasy football insurance. They'll bring you on. How many of you have like the morning relationship show? It's like, hey, we're the Burt Show, and we've got Julie on the Disguiser. You know, uh, her, her and her husband are having money problems. You know, or they have things that they talk about in, in your morning drive shows. 
if you give them good pitches for ideas, you'll come on. Radio segments are also about 10 or 11 minutes. That's it. So you'll be on. It'll be a quick conversation. And then you'll give something away on the radio. So I'm not a big fan of the Saturday Retirement Symphony shows. I've integrated really well with a rock show. I'm on a rock station every week right now. It's like a, it's, I would say it's like one notch below a Howard Stern show. And they go on from 5.30 to 9. I go on once a week and we talk about anything and everything. This week we talked about how do you know if you have a spending addiction, right? And so the first thing I talked about is that if you have an Amazon package that comes to your house every day, you probably have a spending addiction. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's me. You know, that's, my, that's my husband. That's my wife. You know? And then we just we BS for about 10 or 15 minutes. Unfortunately, again, you might think that you're talking about these low-grade topics, so somebody who's rich won't do business with you. It's not true. You're just, you're just seen as the expert on radio. And so you don't have to get on there. Like, um, anybody do a Saturday show? I don't know if you do or you don't, but if you hear them, it's like, hi, I'm Mike Lloyd, the Retirement Symphony. You know, and they, the shows just seem so canned, and you can compete so much better against it by being integrated. Um, doing your own radio show, I don't know if it's going to make you a financial expert when the 1067 news station has five shows on a Saturday, right? I mean, that's the way it is in most of the city. So um, all these stations are looking for stories. Your local magazines, if you're in a local city and there's like, in me, there's like the Buckhead News in these local magazines, they're all looking for stories. They need digitized content and other content, and you don't have to advertise to get it in there. You just got to give them ideas. They need the content so they can get what? Advertising. That is the name of the game. So I've been able to do a lot of radio in Atlanta. And so after you know, eight years of doing this, when people hear Oxygen in Atlanta, I mean, I don't know if we're a household name, but in like that RIA space, we're as good of an independent known name in Atlanta as anybody else that's in that space. You know, we don't have the branding to compete with Schwab and TD Ameritrade and stuff like that, but we, um, we, uh, uh, this is an easy way to get on radio. And then the last thing in here is that you may be podcasting. Again, this is all integrated. The podcast that I do is called The Shrimp Tank. Um, basically, this is a take on the shark tank. But most of your, most of your local uh, colleges now are starting to get degrees in entrepreneurship. If you can find the college in your town that has entrepreneurship, what I do in The Shrimp Tank is I bring on kids a couple of times a month. They angel pitch like they would on Shark Tank, but we don't fund them. And then I bring on CEOs two or three times a month to interview them about the do's and don'ts of running a business. It's a little bit like Entrepreneur on Fire, except that we've got sort of Shark Tank mixed in. But it's great for biz dev because how will I get in front of a 100-person owner? Very difficult. On this show, in conjunction with the college, not difficult at all. Very, very easy. So if you look at it, Shrimp Tank podcast. If you look at it, I can show you. It, I think it can be modeled in a, in a lot of cities. So final thoughts on this is that what makes you a better financial advisor? I mean, I will never claim to be the best money manager or, you know, we've got the best strategy about X, Y, and Z. But, but I know that consumers are very influenced by what they see on TV. So my blogging TV media strategy is focused on gaining the trust of the consumer. And then over time, they'll come to my website and come in as a lead. We average between 22 and 25 leads a week that come into our website right now. So I don't outbound market. It's all, I all move people down a lead funnel. People self-select themselves to become a lead, and then we call them. Third of the leads are suck. You know, they're, they're, they're people that are completely broke. We can't help them. You know, a third of the leads are manageable, and a third of the leads are meaty. You know, it sort of works out that way. And so um, we'll, we'll probably bring in between 100 and I would say 125 million of assets under management this year organically from this kind of marketing. So it's, it's pretty significant. First key walking away from today, I'd say, is try and get on one of the 10 o'clock news. If you can do that, you'll, you'll get your start. You'll be amazed about not only what your existing clients think, but people will see you in the community when you went and um, they'll start to grow your business. So any other final questions?